Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question asks if I can analyze the mental health and personality factors that may be at work in the case of Carl Panzram. Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I'll put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. So before I get started, I have two notes about this case. First, to say that Carl Panzram was an active criminal is a bit of an understatement. He committed a number of crimes, and for many of those crimes, the only record we have is from his own writing, which of course may not be accurate. Second, Carl committed a number of assaults of a sexual nature. So when I say the word assault in this video, that is what I'm referring to. Normally, I try to separate the background from the timeline of the crimes, but in the case of Carl Panzram, the background and the timeline of the crimes are really the same thing. He started his criminal career when he was young, so I'll cover the background and timeline together, then move to the mental health and personality factors. So starting with the background and the timeline, Carl Panzram was born Charles Panzram on June 28, 1891, in East Grand Forks, Minnesota. He grew up on a family farm with five brothers and one sister. It didn't take long for Carl to find trouble. Sometime around the age of five or six, he was already stealing and lying pathologically. His father left when Carl was around seven or eight years old. Carl was arrested for drunk and disorderly in 1899, so eight years old. Always eager to reinvent himself, he was arrested again in 1903 for being drunk and incorrigible, so disorderly just wasn't going to cut it anymore. That same year, he would steal a revolver from the house of one of his neighbors, and he would be sent to the Minnesota State Training School in Red Wing, Minnesota. This was a juvenile detention facility. When he was there, he was not only beaten and tortured, but was the victim of repeated assaults. He started fantasizing about revenge. He'd burned one of the buildings there to the ground, and he was released after that. Carl continued to commit thefts, and he was drinking heavily by this point. He tried to kill a teacher with a revolver. He ran away from home. When he was 13 or 14, he was traveling on freight trains and committed a number of crimes, including theft. He was assaulted by four men while riding one of those trains. So we see here that Carl was quite violent, but he was also the victim of violence. He was arrested for burglary and sent to the Montana State Reform School. He escaped there in 1905, committed arson and burglary a number of times, then enlisted in the United States Army. Not surprisingly, he was arrested shortly after this for theft and was sentenced to prison. He would be in Fort Leavenworth until 1910. Later, Carl claimed that anything good left in him was crushed during the time he was in Leavenworth. Over the next few years, he was arrested many times in a number of places. He committed crimes like theft, assault, robbery, burglary, and escaping jail or prison. He used an alias much of the time. So just going through a few places where he was incarcerated, he was in Texas and released. In California, he escaped. In Oregon, escaped. Washington, released. In Montana, he escaped, was arrested again for another crime, incarcerated, and then he was released. Then he was incarcerated in Oregon again. He helped another inmate escape from the Oregon State Penitentiary, and that prisoner killed the warden. Carl would escape from that prison in 1917. He was recaptured, and he escaped again in 1918 by sawing through the bars. I imagine this caused the prison to reconsider their hacksaw for every prisoner policy. During his many incarcerations, he was far from a model prisoner. He had a particular penchant for attacking correction officers. Often they would return the favor to Carl. So there was a real violent interaction there between Carl and the staff at the prisons. According to Carl, after his escape, he made his way to New York and then traveled to 31 different countries in South America, Europe, and Africa. In those places, he continued to commit murder, theft, and other crimes. In 1920, Carl made his way to New Haven, Connecticut, where he burglarized a property owned by William Howard Taft, who had been president of the United States. Evidently, Taft had a lot to steal. Carl took bonds, jewelry, and a semi-automatic pistol, specifically 
a 45 caliber Colt M 1911. He bought a yacht with the money he gained from that crime. He would hire sailors to work on that yacht, assault them, shoot them in the head with the Colt, and throw their bodies overboard. According to Carl, he did this 10 times before he ran the yacht aground near Atlantic City. By October 1920, he would be arrested in Connecticut for burglary and carrying concealed weapons. He would be sentenced to six months in jail. He then made his way to the west coast of Africa and worked on an oil rig. After this, he committed more murders before making his way to Massachusetts, where he continued to commit murders and assaults. He was arrested again on June 29, 1923, in New York. Eleven days later, he attempted to escape from jail. He was unsuccessful, but he asked his lawyer to bail him out of jail. Carl said that he would give his lawyer a boat. Of course, that boat was stolen. The lawyer took the deal. He bailed Carl out of jail and then found out, of course, the boat was stolen. By that time, Carl was gone. On August 26, he was arrested in Larchmont, New York, for burglary and sentenced to five years in prison. He attempted to escape, but he was badly injured. He broke both of his ankles and damaged his back. He was released in July 1928. August 30, 1928, Carl is in Baltimore, Maryland. He is arrested there for a burglary he committed when he was in Washington, D.C. While in jail, he admitted to two murders. He represented himself in the burglary trial in November 1928. On the stand, he admitted that he was not only guilty of the burglary, but he stayed in the house hoping the owners would come home so he could murder them. Evidently, despite the bad reviews, he recently read the book, Confess Your Way to an Acquittal. This time, Carl was sentenced to 25 years to life, and he was returned to Leavenworth. It would not take him long to commit another homicide. He used an iron bar to kill a man who worked in the laundry in June 1929. The trial after that did not go well for Carl. He told the jury, I believe the whole human race should be exterminated. I'll do my best to do it every chance I get. They sentenced him to death after deliberating for less than one minute, and I imagine that many of them felt that was too long. Carl made it clear that he did not have any remorse for any of his crimes. He said that he had no desire to reform. His only desire was to reform people who tried to reform him, and then he added the only way he knew to reform people was to kill them. So I guess it's a good thing he was never put in charge of a reform school. He stopped all efforts to delay his execution, which would occur by hanging on September 5, 1930. Carl Pansram was 39 years old. There are different accounts of his last words, but he said something to the effect of, hurry up, I could hang a dozen men while you're fooling around. Right, so we see he wasn't too patient, even up to the last moment. It is believed that Carl committed 21 murders and several thousand other crimes. Now moving to the mental health and personality factors. It seems fairly clear that Carl's behavior aligns with antisocial personality disorder. Let's take a look at the seven symptoms. Repeated unlawful behaviors. He took this to a new level. Consistent deceitfulness. He used a number of aliases. Impulsivity. This one seems clear. Aggressiveness also seems clear. A reckless disregard for safety. He was quite dangerous to everyone. Consistent irresponsibility, yes, and a lack of remorse, yes, but he did say he had two regrets. He regretted that he mistreated a few animals and that he was unable to murder the entire human race. So here we see a distinction between regret and remorse. Now looking at psychopathy, he had a number of characteristics from both factor one and factor two psychopathy. Looking at these characteristics, he didn't have much in the way of superficial charm or grandiosity but he had the other characteristics like pathological lying, manipulation, lack of remorse that I talked about, shallow affect, a lack of empathy, and a failure to accept responsibility. From factor two psychopathy, we do see sensation seeking, but it's not clear he had a parasitic lifestyle. He was really too busy committing crimes. All the other characteristics though do align with his behavior, like lack of realistic goals, impulsivity, irresponsibility, poor behavioral control, early behavioral problems. He also took that to a new level. Juvenile delinquency, a revocation of conditional release, and criminal versatility. In addition, he was fearless and dominant. Now looking at his personality profile, I will conceptualize this using the five-factor model. 
I remember the big five traits through the acronym OCEAN. Openness to experience, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. So with openness to experience, his level would be mid to high. He was creative, introspective to some degree, and he may have been intellectually curious. For conscientiousness, the level would be low. He did not seem thoughtful, organized, productive, sensible, enterprising, or ambitious, although one could argue he was enterprising and ambitious in the area of crime. In terms of extroversion, we see a mid to low level. To say that he was not friendly was a bit of an understatement. He wasn't outgoing either, but he was assertive and excitement seeking. He had low agreeableness. We see no empathy. He did not trust people. He was not straightforward. He did not strike me as gentle, generous, cordial, tolerant, or willing to comply with the rules. With neuroticism, we see he splits this trait, so he has high and low facets. He wasn't really depressed or anxious, but he had almost no ability to resist temptation. Even among vicious serial killers, Carl Panzram stands out for a number of reasons. Even though he tried to escape, he tried not to get caught, he was not discouraged by the threat of punishment. He endured horrible attacks in prison at the hands of the guards, and that did not modify his behavior. He was incorrigible. Carl's ability to beat the system much of the time was incredible. Law enforcement agencies did not communicate too much with each other during that time, and he took advantage of this by simply using an alias. Carl was able to get lighter sentences because his entire criminal history wasn't being used in many of the sentencing processes. Also, his ability to escape from jail and prison was remarkable. I guess he just had more experience than the people working at those facilities. He had been in many, after all. He had seen a number of different jails and prisons. Carl developed a dislike for his mother early on. This changed to disgust and then to hatred. Eventually, he would add everybody to the list of people he hated, except for a prison guard named Henry Lesser. Lesser had encouraged Carl to write down his story. And that's why so much of his story is available today. It's hard to imagine anybody being more vicious than Carl Panzram. All he knew in his life was hurt and pain. He was rarely ever extended even a moment of compassion. He had a labored, tortured existence committed to causing suffering. Now, some say that Carl was the most unpredictable killer among all serial killers, like he would be the most frightening to be near. If we think about something like an exercise where perhaps somebody is paid to sit in the same room with different killers, how willing would people be to do this even for quite a bit of money? Which killers would be associated with the highest compensation, meaning that people would only sit with them if they were paid a lot of money to do that? So in thinking about this, I ranked a number of well-known serial killers from the least frightening to the most frightening, or to put it another way, those that could attract people to sit in the same room as them for minimal compensation as compared to those who would need to offer more substantial compensation. Starting with the least frightening or the lowest level of compensation, we see somebody like David Berkowitz, the son of Sam. He has been interviewed many times. He doesn't seem particularly scary. Then moving to somebody like Harold Shipman, Dr. Death, he didn't have access to the lethal means in jail that he'd used on the outside. Next would be Kenneth Bianchi, the Hillside Strangler. He was trying to get out, claiming multiple personalities. So in that sense, he was cooperative. He wasn't trying to cause trouble. He was trying to beat the system. Next would be Joel Rifkin. He just doesn't seem that motivated. Somebody like Ed Kemper would be next on the list. He was resigned to his life in prison. He almost seemed to like it there somewhat. So it would be unlikely he would try to hurt somebody if they were in a room with him. Jeffrey Dahmer, he wasn't dangerous in jail, although he was in danger. He was murdered by another inmate. Ted Bundy, people spent a lot of time with him. He was interviewed many times. He never attacked anybody. Arthur Shawcross, the Genesee River killer. He had no social skill, so he was a little bit scarier. He was interviewed many times, though, and he never hurt anybody during those interviews. Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker. I think we're getting more frightening at this level. He was more unpredictable in his crimes, although, again, technically in jail. I don't recall him hurting anybody. Richard Kukwinski, the Iceman, he was interviewed several times, but he definitely seemed more frightening, at least in those interviews. And this takes me to Carl Panzram. 
there was really no limit to what he would do and no way to know when he would decide to attack. Even still, I imagine a lot of people would be comfortable sitting with any of these killers and probably many people would want to simply to learn more about the story of those killers. So that's what I came up with. In my opinion, Carl would actually be the most frightening killer as far as sitting in a room with him. So summing everything up, this is a tragic case. Carl was determined to kill and destroy to the greatest extent he possibly could. His anger was pure, without limits. He was completely out of control. He was shaped by violence. He became the extreme version of those who committed crimes against him. So those are my thoughts on Carl Pan's Ram. As I was putting the list together of all those well-known serial killers, I was wondering who on that list people would want to interview if they had the chance, right? Which ones are interesting in that type of situation to sit down and just ask them questions or have a conversation? I think if I could pick from that list, I would go with Carl Pan's Ram, Richard Kukensky, Ted Bundy, and Harold Shipman. Please put your picks in the comments section. You could use the list that I provided here or pick from any killer. I think it's really kind of a fascinating topic. Who would really be the most interesting killer to talk to? As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be interesting. Thanks for watching.